And uh, yeah, we're just glad to be here. Uh, want to just give you a little um, history of how we came to be involved with Israel. So when I was about 18, my dad uh, made his first trip to Israel and uh, brought my brother and, and I over there. And he saw a need to help the farmers. And he just wanted to find a way to actually do something practical to help Israel. So this was about 19 years ago. We've made our first trip. And uh, since then, the organization has grown. We've brought about 3,445 volunteers to Israel uh, since that time from all over the world. That's from 22 different countries. Yeah, several different countries of the world. And so uh, it's an organization that goes just to go bless Israel, to go bless them uh, in a material way. I, uh, I overheard that you guys here at this church are studying through the book of Daniel. And there it says those who know their God will take action, right? And so we, we just want to be a people of action, amen? That we want to know God, have that intimacy with him, and then when the time comes, we're ready to take action. We can actually move on that, um, that relationship with God. So, uh, yeah, I, thought, I thought it'd be fun for you all if I spoke a little bit of Hebrew. My role when I was a part of the organization was to teach all of the students and all of the staff, the family, Hebrew. I have several brothers right now that are right in the middle of the situation over there, and it helps a lot to be able to speak Hebrew to be able to relate to the situation and the people there. I just wanted to speak a little bit of Hebrew. <laughs> also, to say that this is a miracle that's happening in our generation. So the, the miracle that the Jewish people returned to the state of Israel and the fact that they're speaking Hebrew, which was a dead language for 2,000 year, years, is a, a total miracle that's happening in our generation, in our time. So, okay, back to English. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so just to give you guys an idea of what's happening right now, uh, my family is on, are you all familiar with the Mount of Blessing here? Mount of Blessing? Uh, there, so you have Mount of Blessing and Mount of Cursing in Deuteronomy 27, 28 there. Um, yeah, so, you, so there, my family has a base, a volunteer base, on the Mount of Blessing. It's right, it's right in the, surrounded, by, you may have heard of Shechem or Nablus. Uh, that's a huge Arab city. It's right down the valley. Uh, John 4, woman at the well, this uh, story would have happened at the base of the mountain of Harbaka. So a lot of history there. They say roughly 85% of the Bible was written in this area known as, by the world as the West Bank, but uh, biblically, Judea and Samaria. So 85% of the Bible was written in this location. But um, so my family is on this mountain, and since the war broke out, the res- all the reserves pretty much have been called up. They're saying, we need you. They're on, they're on the front lines, either in the north or the south. And so there's been this great need to, there's this outpost, you know, around my family's uh, base there. There's these military outposts surrounding that, They've had these crises where like, they, these guys are guarding. They don't even have water and food. So my sister, for example, just recently uh, was, gathered together with some other women in the community and started making food for them, b- delivering it to the outpost. And like they had gone without water for a while, delivering water to them. So real practical needs right now for people just to fill. And so my it's family... Just taken, yeah. so it's been such a huge surprise on the whole country that they're just trying to figure out how to make things work. And so it's, it's very chaotic somewhat right now. And so they're just starting to, to go. So these like things that you would think, oh, this would be like an obvious thing. We're going to feed, give food and water to our, well, they don't, they don't have it. They don't have it. And so everyone, the whole country is getting together and just meeting some of these practical needs. Um, there's a whole group of Jews um, in Israel that don't join the IDF. They're the ultra-Orthodox um, and right now they're sponsoring flights. They're flying bunches and bunches of Jewish people from all over the world to come back to join the fight, to join the, the IDF during this time. So uh, just another story, just 
from my family. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of these communities just spread across Judea and Samaria. A lot of them are up on mountaintops, and you have the Arabs down the valley. And so my brother, my youngest brother, so I'm the oldest of the 11, and so my youngest brother, he's about 19, uh, 19 or 20, something like that. But anyway, he, get, he got called, he, our friends called him up and said, hey, we are at our, basically at the end of our rope. We've been staying up nights on end, uh, guarding our little settlement. Can you come give us a break? And so my younger brother, he says, yeah, we'll be down there. So family's located in Samaria. Uh, he travels down south, goes to Judea to this settlement. It's basically just two guys with their families on this mountaintop with Arabs all in the valley. Uh, and so it's a vulnerable, just to kind of help you all understand how vulnerable the situation is. The, the soldiers that are normally in these areas are on the battle line right now. So there's this, uh, this is need. So my brother goes uh, with a friend of his. And they look down the valley, and he says his friend saw this angel in the valley. And, uh, and he actually yelled at him and said, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it just reminded me of the story. I, 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 go ahead. Also, well, just to say, they sent them out there. Like, the, the other two guys that were guarding this area, both had, they both had been a part of the military. They carry guns. Uh, like most Israelis do. Uh, these guys are guys that were out there, out in bulletproof vests and a flashlight. <laughs> and so that's why he was like, oh, I'm so glad <laughs> there's some angels out there right now. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's incredible just what, yeah, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> but it just reminded me of the story. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Second Kings 6, 16. So Elijah and his servant, they're surrounded by these Assyrian armies. And it says... Uh, uh, Elisha goes, so he answered, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. Mm-hmm. And so I just want to encourage you. I, I've been in contact with my family, talking to them. They're not afraid. And I want to encourage all of us. They're, they're right in the middle of the situation. But my sister, she's incredible. They, they were driving through the uh, middle of this, this Arab town, and they had their, uh, their bulletproof vest on. Yeah. And she's like, hey, look at our nice vest. You know, these are cool, aren't they? <laughs> she had this little video. But I just, want, I just want to say, we're not coming here bringing a message of fear. We're just, we want to bring you all to awareness so you know how to pray. Um, this is not an hour to be afraid. Not a time to be afraid. It's a time to stand firm in what we believe and, and to, you know, the West, we haven't experienced this kind of thing, but it's happening all over, the, you know, China and Middle East, these type of things are going on, these difficult situations. But don't be afraid. Don't, do not be afraid. Over and over again throughout the scriptures, right, do not be afraid. And a lot of them are in the context of Israel. Say, Israel, don't be afraid. And so our family is there telling the people of Israel, do not fear. God is with you. So uh, we want to get in a little bit of the history. So the, I'm sure many of you have heard the West Bank. Uh, it, that, that's a, more of a political term. It's the West Bank of the Jordan River. Uh, but biblically, it's Judea and Samaria. And if you're, if you're interested uh, in looking at this on a political level, the, uh, the UN has over and over again uh, sa- put sanctions on Israel, or, or you know, uh, UN resolutions against Israel, um, and the, the West Bank is a big part of that. But they, uh, they've just been hammering Israel for, for years. Uh, they actually hammer Israel worse than they do North Korea. The, no, it, the only way you can make sense of it is it's a spiritual battle. Um, nor, as many of you know, North Korea is horrendous. Israel cares. Iran. Iran, yeah, Iran, North Korea. Uh, Israel actually cares even for their enemies. They're, they're giving advance warning to, before they drop these bombs for civilians to move. Um, I could tell you several stories of the ways that Israel goes out of their way to protect the innocent, the children, um, so that the UN is bringing these things against them is totally unexplainable, there's a, but there's a spiritual battle going on. Uh, did you want to share anything else? Yeah, there? I just thought <laughs> it's good to just have some history. I know before um, I made my first trip to Israel uh, in, I believe it was 2007, um, and it was a real eye opener for me. I like, I had a real like God moment there. Like my whole, I, it just totally, the trip totally changed my life. Um, but I knew nothing about it. I didn't understand why. And so, um, so anyways, there's just a lot of things that it's just good to know about. Um, and one of them is, um, is this whole thing with uh, Judea and Samaria. 
and you know Judea and Samaria uh, is what everyone else calls the West Bank, and um, you know this is where most of your Bible was written. And so to think, oh, we'll just take this little piece and give it to the Palestinians for a nation, it doesn't make sense. It's actually where a lot of these promises that God made to the people of Israel, those actually took place in that land. Like the part uh, where um, he took Abraham and said, look all around this area, I'm giving this land to your descendants. That happened in Samaria. Um, in Anatote, where Jeremiah took the the, the the, um, the the pot and he stuck the deed to the land and he and he dug it a, a hole and buried it and he said this place you're going to come back here and you're going to plant vineyards and you're going to come back to this place that's that's in Samaria um, the place uh, Beit El where Jacob laid his head down right and uh, had this dream angels ascending and descending God said I'm going to bring you back to this land I give to your descendants in Judea and Samaria. So if we don't know that, then we could just think, oh, it's just a little hunk of land. Let the Palestinians have a little hunk of land. This is the heart of the Jewish people. It's the heart of our heritage, the Bible. Uh, if we believe in the word of God, we have to stand and say God was truthful when he spoke those things to his people. He is faithful. He's a faithful God, and he's going to see that those words come to full fruition, and we need to stand behind that. Yeah, and we just want to say, too, you know, in, in sharing this, our hearts are, um, we, we have compassion for the Arab people as well. Uh, there, a lot of these people are victims of a very evil uh, government. And so anything we say tonight, we don't want people to leave and think that, you know, we, we, we hate Arabs. No, we, we, we love the Arab people. In the, in the, actually, in the prophets, it talks about how the Arabs have a plan in this whole thing, too. In, in Isaiah 60, I believe, is a chapter it says that, that the rams of Nebaoth, this is a son of Ishmael, will ascend with acceptance on the altar. The Arab people have a, a, a prophetic destiny in this whole situation as well. So we need to pray for them as well. We need to pray for, um, you know, as I think many of you know, there's revelation of Jesus being poured out in Arab nations. And so just praying for that to happen in Gaza right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, going on. Uh, so uh, yeah. I'm just going to say, okay, so... Just to, just another just education blip. Um, the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation, I don't know what those stands organization. for. Organization. Organization. Okay, <laughs> the PLO um, was founded uh, before 1967. So in 19, uh, before 1967, Israel had this little sliver of land. It was uh, at its skinniest place. It was only nine miles wide. Uh, the PLO was founded. They wanted... Palestine for themselves. They already had Judea and Samaria. They already had Gaza. They had all of these areas and they formed this place. Now, uh, what they claim is they want Judea and Samaria for the Palestinians. Well, it's hard that the, to say that they're being honest with that uh, because they've been saying uh, they've wanted this Palestinian state before uh, Judea and Samaria was ever even in the hands of the Jewish people. And so the, clearly their dream is to wipe out the Jewish state. And we have to understand the motives that are, that are behind um, what's going on right now. And um, again, just another history, uh, the Jewish people, uh, you know, as probably many of you know, uh, went to Israel after the Holocaust. They formed the Jewish state. They claimed uh, this statehood. Uh, praise the Lord, our president at that time, uh, Truman, was the first to call within moment and minutes. Missourian. And Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> called and said, yes, we stand behind this. Uh, one day later, they were attacked from every nation around them. A complete miracle that they saw victory. They lost Jerusalem, but they saw victory, and they were able to make it as a people. And it was a total um, miracle. 1967, uh, they have this war, and they get back Jerusalem. And this is where we go into like a lot of our crazy politics. Uh, they get back in six days. You all know about the six-day war, right? total miracle. They get back Jerusalem. They get back all these places where the Jewish people had to fled after the War of Independence. Uh, they get back all these places. And you know what they did because of international pressure? They gave it back into the hands of the Jordanians. 
And so um, this is uh, something that we're seeing a repeated, um, uh, we're, we're seeing this repetition here of the United the nations pressuring Israel uh, to let go of of these God given things and to to surrender them. And so Gaza is a part of that. Gaza was given back. Uh, Israel pulled out from Gaza in 2005 in the Bush administration as a peace, uh, uh, you know, to to bring peace. Uh, and so all the Palestinians moved in there and they turned it into a complete terrorist pit. Uh, they thought that um, they were going to have a democ democracy within Palestine. They had elections and get what, guess what, who they voted in? They voted in Hamas. And they haven't had an election since. And that was in 2005. And so this is what we're seeing now, the fruition of a whole bunch of people in this wickedness that uh, they clearly have stated they want to wipe Israel and the Jewish people off, the, off of the face of the earth. And so, uh, so anyways, this is where we're at now. <laughs> is, um, this is after Israel has given this land uh, for peace. And this is, how they're, uh, this is where we find ourselves now at this time. Yeah, I just want to add to that from a historical perspective. There's always, pretty much throughout history, there's a person that wants to destroy the Jewish people, whether that's Haman, Antiochus, Yasser Arafat, uh, the Iranians. There's always a person that has this demonic, I believe, uh, motivation to kill Jewish people, to, to annihilate them. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to encourage us. Um, this is nothing new. This, is, this has been around for a long time. Uh, but we need to realize the weapons of our warfare. Uh, what did Esther do when she realized this, that the state of the Jewish people, that the, the survival of the Jewish people was at stake? She said, call a fast, call a fast, three days, gather them together, fast and pray. And so our ministry actually called a fast uh, just a couple days ago. But I encourage, if, if, you, if you hear things like that, you can be a part of the solution to this problem. Mm -hmm. I, I believe it was Esther's gathering together in fasting and prayer that turned the tide on this situation that was, that was happening. And so we as believers, we can be a part of the solution. There's a demonic battle raging right now. Let's take up the weapons of our warfare and engage, and engage in this battle, fasting and prayer. This, this is not a time to be on the sidelines. This is a time to be totally engaged with what God's called us to do and as our part. Um, we don't want just to be people that are just watching the news, right? We want to be engaged in our part, our part in this battle. I just want to mention, uh, this is a, a quote from Hamas, just so you understand where they're at. He said, they say, there is no solution for the Palestinian problem except by jihad. Jihad, everybody knows what that is. It's, uh, it's the uprising of the Arabs to overthrow people that don't go with, with uh, Islam. Uh, it says, uh, initiatives, proposals, and international conferences are but a waste of time and exercise in futility. So they're looking at all these peace talks and stuff and going, we don't even want that. We just want, we just want total annihilation. That's what, that's what Hamas desires. But um, we all believe they're not going to get that. Amen? <laughs> they're, they're, they will not, the word of God is true. They will not succeed in their mission. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Mm -hmm. uh, God is going to rise up for their defense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also, I, you know, I think one of the mysteries that I always thought was like, what, you know, where did the Palestinian uh, name come from? There was never a, an actual nation called Palestine ever. So uh, what happened here? And, um, you know, after this war for independence, when uh, Israel really, you know, uh, claimed that, that land there, what happened was there was a bunch of, um, of Arab people that were living in that land. Um, now, the natural thing would have been for Jordan or some of these neighboring Muslim countries to absorb uh, this population of Muslims, uh, but they all refused. Uh, and they continue to this day, they refuse to absorb these people into their society. So it's a, um, it's a strange uh, thing. Uh, because when you just think, I mean, just from a, a natural, just looking at the situation, um, there's a lot of Christian nations in the world, right? We can go to a Christian nation, ex hopefully expect not to be persecuted. That's changing all the time. Uh, but there's Muslims, they go to move to a Muslim country, right? And they can practice their uh, Muslim faith. The Jewish people, where do they go? Israel. Israel is the only place in the whole world where a Jew can go and everything shuts down on Shabbat. 
the whole world. Get, they just celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. Everyone had these little huts out on their, on their porches. Uh, there's nowhere else. Like even if we celebrate it here, we're the weird ones, right? <laughs> uh, but in Israel, it's like they live this different culture that's very specific from them, uh, from anywhere else. And it's the only place where they can go and be a part of this culture and be safe. And they should be safe, right? They should be safe to walk, uh, to walk this out. Um, the Muslims, there's a whole host of Muslim nations out there. So the whole thing is, is just a, a crazy kind of a, a, a circumstance. So. I just want to mention a friend of ours there, I got an update from him yesterday, just to show the, the irony of the situation. So in October 2011, one Israeli soldier was released from the hands of Hamas in exchange for 1,027 Israelis. Or, uh, no, Hamas. sorry, exchange for 1,027 Hamas prisoners. So one Israeli for 1,027 uh, Hamas. Hamas prisoners. Uh, one of them is now the head of Hamas. He was treated and cured of cancer while a prisoner. He is the one that organized the massacre that just happened. So they're, they're taking advantage of the kindness. Of, so they, they had this Hamas terrorist in their prison, treated him for cancer, and then he turns around once they let him go with this exchange, and he, he orchestrates this whole massacre. So it's just, it's just totally uh, just a loss for words of how evil this is. Very evil. Um, this, just to understand, understand how serious this attack was on set, this past Saturday, uh, this attack is the worst since the Holocaust. There's not been a time when this n number of Jewish people have died um, in one day like this in such a brutal way since the Holocaust. Uh, it, it, we, we relate to 9-11, right? When, our, when the Twin Towers were hit, the whole nation, I mean, I remember where, everybody remembers where they were, 9-11, right? It's like you, we got the news, devastating. Proportionally, what happened in Israel is 20 times worse than 9-11. When we consider the population of Israel and the population of the United States, 20 times worse what just happened on Saturday. Very, very serious. So, um, like I said, it's a time for us to not shrink back in fear, but to engage in this battle, to pray, to fast. It's a time for us to really be a part of, of the solution. Yes, sir. Uh, we're going to look at a little bit. I just want to look at a few scriptures. Uh, I appreciate Pastor Scott. He's been teaching you guys about the importance of Israel. Uh, so you guys are, are well aware, I believe, of the scriptural underpinning of supporting Israel. But I just want to um, solidify and just encourage you guys. Uh, Genesis 12 says, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country from your family and your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And here's the part that I want to emphasize. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. And so there's a blessing for blessing Israel, and there's a curse for cursing. And I want to point out something that's not really present in the, in the English here. Uh, in the Hebrew, it says, Umekalelcha aor venivrechu. It's, it's saying here that those who curse Israel are basically, the, the Hebrew word is the word connected to kal, which means light. And basically, you can be translated as those who make light of Israel. Those who are, you could almost say indifferent. Like those who make light of Abraham's descendants, of Abraham, um, they're going to be cursed. And so it's a, the, the Hebrew is a little bit stronger. Because some people go, well, um, you know, I don't really have a heart for Israel. And I, I, God bless you. If you have a heart for other nations of the world, that's great. I encourage you, though, don't make light of Israel. This scripture, it, it's, uh, you, can, you can look at this yourself, but it's, it's this idea of lightly esteeming. Some translations say those who lightly esteem you will be cursed. And so let's not lightly esteem Israel. God has a prophetic purpose for them, and we need to be praying for them. We know in Psalm 122, we're, it's the only city in the world that we're commanded to pray for. Uh, if, you, if you could go, I mean, you could say Jeremiah, it talks about pray for the city that you're in as well. You know, pray for the city that you're in, that's important too. But it's specifically praying for Jerusalem, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That is a command that we are called to, uh, to walk out, to pray for Jerusalem. Isaiah 62 
another passage I just want to point out. I feel uh, my, my soul has been in tension since Saturday, because my family being there, and I, and it's, I just started calling pastors, and I was like, can I come and share? The, the call, I believe, for me right now is to awaken people to be watchmen, and this is what Isaiah 62 call, talks about, is the need for watchmen. I, it, really, deep down, I want to be there. It might sound strange, a war zone, but I, I want to be there because my family's there and the nation of Israel needs comfort right now. But I figure if I can't be there, my passport's not even updated, so I couldn't be there even if I wanted. But I figure if I can't be there, at least I can go and share and try to bring awareness and bring a, the severity of the situation and just the call, call to be watchmen. So Isaiah 62, verse 6, God says, I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, all of you, you were earlier worshiping, all of you fall in this category, don't you? You make mention of the Lord. If you make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent and give him no rest till he establishes and till he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. This word here uh, mentions... Hamaz Kirim, it's actually connected to the Hebrew word for secretary. And you know how a secretary with her with their boss, they'll come and they'll tell them, you know, this is these are the things that are happening. Um, these are a list of things that you know you need to look at. And so there's this idea with this passage that we're kind of like God's secretaries, like we're saying, God, I encourage you as you're praying for Israel, just open up almost to any prophet. Most most prophets, you can open up the passage, Amos nine, God. Remember you said in your word, Amos 9, that you would plant them in their land and they would no longer be, be pulled up. We can just remind God of his word, remind him of his promises. And that's what a watchman, as watchmen, we're called to do that. Take these prophetic words. Say, Father, remember your word. Remember what you've promised. Please bring this down. We have an example of Daniel, right? Daniel, he has the promise that after 70 years in Babylon, they're going to go back. Does he just sit back and go, all right, let's watch it happen. He doesn't do that, does he? He begins to cry out to God. And so that's, we want to be Daniels in our generation. We want to be those that had the prophetic word. We see the promises of God and we engage with them. We pray, God, there's, there's going to be a call more so as things get more intense, this call will become, more, will become stronger. The, the call for watchmen. God is going to raise up watchmen who cry out. God uses intercession to accomplish his purposes. Amen? He uses the prayers of his people. He's taking in Revelation. We see the bowls being filled up with prayer, and then he releases his purpose in the earth. And so that's, that's, that's where we come into this situation. We, we say cry out to God. We're praying. We're fasting. We're crying out. And then God takes our prayers and brings forth his will. Amen? So we can all be a part of this. We can be Daniel's reminding God of his word. Daniel said, it's been 70 years now. God, do what you promised. We can look at after 2,000 years in, in exile, the Jewish people coming back, there's 64, those who are taking notes, I know there's some note takers out there, 64 prophecies about the people of Israel, come, the Jewish people coming back to their land. That's a large number of prophecies. We look at Israel coming back, the Jewish people coming back, and we say, thank you, Father, you're true to your word. And then we continue to pray. You know, in 1948, there was actually, it's, uh, it's recorded, there were many people, many believers that went on 40-day fast in 1948, praying for Israel, praying for the Jewish people. The 40-day fast. There, what I'm trying to point out to you guys is there's a connection between what God's doing in Israel, what he's doing in the earth, and the prayer and fasting of his people. And we, we get to be a part of this. And so let's, uh, let's not shrink back. Let's engage with what God's doing in our generation. Yeah, I just wanted to share a dream that I had several years ago. Um, and I'm probably going to be a little bit fuzzy with it. But um, 
I had this dream that I walked into um, this Jewish synagogue and they were um, and they were doing their prayers and stuff and I was kind of standing in the back and then uh, the it, the service was uh, let go and I was standing in the back and as the Jewish people were walking out I was just kissing their feet as they were as they were walking out and uh, and so they they all walked out and I walked out the door with them. And I started walking down the street and this lady comes up and she grabs me and she goes, were you in with the Jews? She said, don't you know they don't believe in Jesus? And I said, looked at her and I said, but don't you know that they're anointed to usher in the Messiah? And then I woke up. And so um, I think it's something that we have to understand their place and their part. Uh, when Yeshua, when Jesus came the first time, it was a massive work that was happening in the Jewish people. Uh, John the Baptist was risen up to, to prepare the way of the Lord, right? Uh, well, now we've got all the nations here and we're all just getting ready for this return of Jesus. He's going to come back, right? And so this is something that we have to recognize their part. It's not going to happen without the Jewish people. It's not going to happen without Israel, um, without Israel, Israel walking in some of the fruitfulness of these prophecies that were spoken. This is something that we need to understand our connection to. And, you know, I know that um, this, this week going through all of this, uh, Brayden and I have blood, in, uh, my sister's over there with her whole family. Uh, Braden's whole family is over there. Uh, we've, we feel the weight of this because we've got relatives that are over there, right? I mean, we just for two days were kind of just like, oh, like what, what are we doing? What do we do? What do we do? And, um, and so I just want us to recognize uh, uh, Yeshua, Jesus, when he prayed uh, right before he went uh, to give his life, what was he praying for when he was just crying out to God? What was the theme of that prayer? He was praying, God, make them one as, as I am one with you. Make them one. He's praying for unity, right? And um, the Jewish people, before this war broke out, we're at the verge of collapse. The, the state of Israel has been struggling for years, uh, trying to find some things to stand on. And there's been these dividing things that are issues. The government's been uh, close to falling apart several times. Really bad spot. Well, this war has woken them up. They're all helping each other. People that were on the opposite sides, they just formed a, a unity government just today. Um, they're uniting uh, because they realize we all need to be in this. The enemy is coming against us and we have to get together to fight, okay? And I just wanna put it out there that when Yeshua prayed that prayer, he included us and it included the Jewish people. And so he wants us to feel that intensity in a greater way. And how we do that is we, we, just, we just have to understand it, first of all. And we have to engage, engage in some way. And like Brain said, this isn't a scary thing. It's not that the enemy is so big and bad and he might just win. It's God uses the enemy to bring his people together. I mean, like, I don't know how he's going to do it, okay? Because um, if you can think even all the churches agreeing on something, Okay, like who can imagine that? It's like, it feels pretty far out there to even think that. But then you add the Jews to it. How in the world is this ever going to work? But he says it is. And so he's using the enemy to, as a tool to bring his people together. And so, um, and so I pray that we are able to understand this in a great, greater way and that we're able to, uh, to engage. And when, um, you know, Romans 12 talks about to, uh, rejoicing with those who rejoice, weeping with those who weep, we have to learn. It's something we got to learn. How do we weep with those who are weeping right now? Because it's hurting. It's, our God is hurting. His heart is hurting to see his people uh, just slaughtered and and uh, it's it's hurting him. We need to we need to weep, uh, just as you know, uh, just as they are weeping. Amen. 
Uh, just want to mention a few things here. Uh, Reese Howells, some of you know the, know the name. Uh, he was instrumental in World War II in gathering people together to pray for victory in World War II. Well, after World War II, he began to pray for the nation of Israel to be born. I just want to read a quote here. We prayed fervently that God's people might at last be granted a home of their own in the land which God had promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. In a wonderful meeting in the Blue Room one night in 1947, when the crucial vote for the partitioning of Palestine was to be cast in the United Nations, the Holy Spirit came upon Reese Howells and us all. We saw the angels of God surrounding the UN building in San Francisco and had the assurance that God would overrule any attempt to thwart his plan for his own people. And so uh, just looking back in history, we can be encouraged that God uses intercession to accomplish his purposes. Uh, other, another person I want to highlight here is Corey Tim Boom's grandfather. Uh, his name was Willem Tim Boom. So in 1844, that's, that was you know, about 100 years, right, before uh, Israel's, Israel's, Israel's uh, declared, a state. declared a state. In 1844, Corey's grandfather, Willem Tim Boom, began a very unique and, and specific prayer group. Willem's prayer group was focused on praying for the well-being of the Jewish people and the peace of Jerusalem. With his father, Willem, uh, Willem, so Willem is the grandfather, Casper is Corey's father. They led together, they led 5,200 intercessory prayer meetings over a span of 100 years for Jerusalem. And, and it's also added, uh, for Jerusalem and the ancient people of God. And so we see how amazing God used Corey Ten Boom uh, to bring awareness, uh, you know, and, and just the love for the Jewish people. But that was something, I just want to point out, that was something that was cultivated for 100 years before the, you know, her story got out to the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really important for us to not be caught off guard, not to be surprised, but to be like uh, Willem and Casper and Corey Tim Boom, their families, their whole family was really a part of the, what was going on there. But that was a heritage that they got. And so I just encourage you, fathers, mothers out there, give that heritage to your children that you all pray as a family for Israel, that you pray for Jerusalem. Children that are raised in that atmosphere of praying for Israel will have a much greater receptivity to understanding what's going on in the world. Uh, they won't just see it as just a, you know, a, a unexplainable, you know, a lot of the secular world just looks at, you know, just the, the Arab-Israeli conflict. You know, it's just seen on totally human terms. No, if you're praying for Israel, if you're praying for Jerusalem, you're going to have more of a spiritual understanding of what's going on. And it's going to help your children process what's happening, what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. And, you know, they're praying for Jerusalem when Jerusalem was some broken down city where, I mean, it was, it wasn't Jerusalem like we think today. Jerusalem is, you know, the city, the city of the great king. It's in Israel, this established place. Uh, but they prayed for it all those years without even having the state of Israel be around. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to encourage you, like, we don't know where uh, this war is going or what's going to happen. Uh, things might die down. Things might get huge. Uh, we're not sure. But even if things die down, I think this is going to be used as a wake-up call uh, for us to engage and not forget about it. Uh, we can't forget uh, we, Jerusalem, right? Uh, it's something that we just can't do. We can't forget Jerusalem. So uh, no matter what happens in the world, uh, I pray that God begins birthing in his people just that heart to see the destiny of Jerusalem come uh, to fruition, uh, just as he did with the Ten Boom family. Um, and I, we named actually our, um, our little daughter who is five months old. She, we actually named her after Corey Ten Boom. She, her due date was April 15th. Corey Ten Boom was born and died on April 15th. And so, uh, and so as I was carrying her, I was like, I feel like this is a girl. And we read Corey Ten Boom's story over while I was pregnant with her. And we were just like, oh yeah, this just, just, just feels right. Um, but what an, an inspiration uh, the Ten Booms were. And I just want to say uh, one of the other reasons that, that um, they were able to stand so strong is that they knew Jew Jewish people, and they loved Jewish people. And so um, keeping our, um, 
trying to make some of the bridging, some of that that relational divide, I think is an important piece too. And so um, as we come in contact with Jewish people, you know, just being able to state straight from the Bible, your God reigns. Like you have the real God. <laughs> like, and just being able to, to encourage them with that, um, I, think, I think will go a long way. Amen. Uh, yeah. I think we're going to wrap up here. I uh, really appreciate y'all coming out and, and hearing our hearts. I uh, want to mention a few things that we have. This is a CD. It has Psalm 113 through 118 on it. It's a, in Hebrew and English. Uh, but this is just something, I, over the years, I've just had a real burden to put the scripture to music, especially the Psalms. And so we have the CD back there. And uh, let's see, what else? This is a book here. I've got a few copies of this. If you want to understand more about Jerusalem, this guy does a great job of connecting revelations with biblical prophecies, uh, you know, Isaiah, Zechariah, but connecting it with passages from the book of Revelation, just kind of tying it together because they're talking about the same thing, right? The prophets are talking about the kingdom to come. Revelation is talking about the kingdom. And so he does a great job of just pointing that out and tying the passages. So it's an incredible resource if you want to understand more about the importance of Jerusalem and uh, its role in, uh, in, in the earth. Uh, so we, we didn't hardly talk at all about our ministry. Uh, so Tally and I, we started a ministry about four years ago called Love and Purity. And so our, our burden is for our nation to turn back to uh, purity, to turn back to loving God and living a life of holiness. And so, but we, we believe that there's joy in that. And so uh, we, this is a t-shirt we just made. It's called Happy Holiness. Um, you don't have to be, uh, you know, grit your teeth, uh, grumpy, holy. You can be happy and be holy too. Um, so happy holiness. And that's what really we want to stand for is that, you know what? There is joy. It says in Psalm 45 that he is anointed with the oil of gladness more than all of his companions because he loves righteousness. So we can love righteousness. We can love holiness and be some of the happiest people in the world. Amen. I mean, we don't, uh, we don't have to be like, oh, you know, just all grumpy about living a holy life. Um, so that, where that's our message uh, as a ministry, you know, to, to live that out. It has a scripture here from Jude. It says, now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. There's joy. There's joy in living for God. There's joy in, in making the right and uh, in, in not yielding to temptation. And God you know, says in his word that he's able to deliver us. And so we can, uh, we can experience that joy in his presence. Yeah. And so uh, we got some of these T-shirts. I also have this other T-shirt. Uh, this, is, this is some, they're, they're older ones. So that my family's organization, Hayuvel, uh, in Israel, they did these. But I just like, you know, it says recognize Jerusalem. Um, so I just, I brought some of them along with me. If, you know, if you guys, you know, want to get some T-shirts uh, just that has Jerusalem on it, you know, something to, to express your, your stand with Jerusalem. Uh, really important. I want to mention, just as we're closing out, to uh, my brother, Joshua, and he has a team over there. It's called the Israel Guys. If you're taking notes, you want to write that down. The Israel Guys, they have one of the number one news outlets coming out of Israel. And so they're giving on-the-ground news uh, from a biblical perspective. Uh, how many out there have heard of the Israel Guys? Just curious. A few of you, okay. So if you type in the Israel Guys, uh, you're going to get firsthand news uh, updates about what's going on in Israel, and uh, and pray for them. They're on the. They're right there in the thick of what's going on. Uh, pray for my brother. Pray for the team there that is uh, that's standing. And uh, just to reemphasize, my brother is so not afraid. I mean, he just walks right into these Palestinian villages, does all these news things. I'm sitting there myself. I'm just going, Joshua, be careful. He just he's fear is not a part of who he is. And I, I'm refreshed by that, uh, too, because I think we need more people rising up right now that are just not afraid. Um, you know, if we die, we get to, we're present with the Lord. Amen? <laughs> I, we, I think sometimes we're too attached to this physical body. We need to be bold and to stand strong. The enemy wants you to fear. Hamas wants you to fear. Don't, don't allow them that, that, uh, that privilege. Don't, don't, don't give that to them. Don't be afraid. We, we have the God of heaven, as I mentioned, the angels, the, the chariots of angels are all on the mountaintops. There's more of us. There's more of us than there are of them. You can be encouraged. We want you to leave encouraged tonight. Yes, it's serious. It's time to be engaged, but do not fear. Fear is going to work against 
uh, what God has for your life. God wants you to be bold. He wants you to stand up when you need to stand up. So don't allow the enemy to shut you down with fear. Yeah, I just wanted to give these two pictures too. Uh, You know, we read in Revelation about this marriage supper of the Lamb, right? And it's going to be awesome, right? This is when uh, Jesus comes back, uh, gathers his people. It's going to be a party, amazing thing, right? But what happens before that? The bride gets ready, right? This is where we are right now. It's this uh, time. He's getting his people ready. So uh, it's not something, there's something that's very good that's going to come from all of this. There's going to be this full, uh, full fruition of everything that he's spoken. And, um, and you know, uh, I was just thinking the other day, to, my sister just had a baby yesterday. And I was just thinking of like a lady in labor, uh, or a lady, that, lady that's pregnant, right? And she's just pregnant and she's getting to the end. And, you know, how many of you know that like pregnant lady that was just like, I just wish I would go into labor, right? And, and like, you could sit there and go like, why would you wish that? Isn't it going to hurt, you know? And, but like, I don't know, like, you know, I know there's multiple views on, on labor and all that stuff. So, uh, but I love going into labor because I'm like, I get to meet this baby soon and it's going to be awesome. And so, um, you know, there is, the earth is groaning. There's like labor pains and there's going to be this like birth, like, and it's going to be incredible, but it's going to hurt. And I actually, when I was in labor with my last, um, my last baby, the last part, I, okay, so I have seven children. I'm in the water. I'm in the very last part where I'm like, okay, it's time for like the baby to come out, which is like the part that I'm like, Ugh. And, and I just, God just like spoke to me in that time. And just, I just felt like I just put my hands out and I just was like, come Yeshua, come. Mm-hmm. And the baby just came. <laughs> and, and I was just like, man, that's what it's going to be like. Like, we're going to be there like at the end being like, oh, the hardest part is right here. And we have to be ready to be like, come Yeshua, come, you know? And so, um, I pray that like, that we aren't bored. That's, you know, I, I just think that it's what we suffer with the most here. Boredom. And man, if we're connected to what God is doing in this earth, we we aren't bored because it's exciting. It's exciting. There's so much to do. There's so much he wants to do in his people. And, um, and so God save us from boredom uh, and, uh, and may he excite us for what is to come because it's an awesome thing. And, you know, we have to look at this ne- next generation. They're going to face a lot. And, you know, I'm raising seven children right now. I don't know what they're going to see, uh, but I know that God doesn't want me to pity them but he wants me to raise warriors that aren't afraid. He wants me to raise children that are ready for what's coming. They have a firm foundation in the word of God, and they are ready to take on whatever God brings uh, into their lives. And so this is what he's calling us to do. And that takes a lot. To raise children like that, that takes that takes a lot. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so maybe we all just get engaged. And as we look at Israel, may it remind us of the battle that we're in and how we need to engage uh, in what he's doing in this earth. Amen. I just want to mention that some of you may want to be, uh, you may want to have uh, ways to give to Israel. Uh, so one of the ways, if you go to Hayavel, the family's website, they are doing a fundraiser right now to help these communities that, that, that surround them uh, with just basic uh, security stuff, flashlights, security vests, stuff like that. There's a big need. There's a big need for drones. Um, so if you're interested in giving, uh, then that is a way that you can, you can give. You can just go on their website and it's, uh, it's right. But the, the, need, the need is great. And so I encourage you, if you have a heart, to be involved in what's going on to, to donate to that, that fundraiser. Yeah, and the end of that story with the uh, two Jewish people that were guarding the mountain and our guys went up and helped, they now have drones now that, so they don't have to be on patrol 24-7 right now. And so they, there's a video of them just being like, thank you, Lord, for Hayavel, that they sent us these drones, these security cameras that were able to go to, go to sleep now uh, and not just be looking out for, for, for stuff all night.
for those who are wanting to know, Hayovel, it's H A Y O V E L. Hayovel. Or the Israel guys. Or the Israel guys, they're, they're connected. If you, if, you, if you go to the Israel guys, they'll connect you to Hayovel. 